our, our, next, our next person on our program is Zach Pinsett from Pinsett Tailoring. Hello, Zach. And he's Hello gladly there. going to talk about Regency clothing. How much do you know about Regency clothing, Zach? Um, I, probably <laughs> in the theme of things, probably not much, I suppose. Uh, you know, it, it's this whole sort of continual journey that we're always, um, we're always learning. Um, yeah. which, and and that journey really never stops. Uh, yeah. You know, I, well, I will leave you. I will um, leave you to tell us all about gentlemen's regency clothing. Oh, thank you very much. So, uh, I thought I'd talk through um, the sort of layers that are involved, uh, starting off with sort of the base layers, as well as doing that through uh, a bit of an examination of a few originals. So. We start right at the bottom, close next to the skin, with stockings. So um, I have these pair of antique stockings, um, probably belonging to a woman because of the shoe size. But uh, this sort of style with this sort of clocking design was still acceptable uh, for men as well. Now, um, these are probably uh, from the early 19th century um, and well we know two things they are um, sort of yeah no they are frame no yeah so these are frame knitted which means uh, that they were uh, knitted on a frame to the shape of a leg and then sewn up the back and here at the back you can see the seam running all the way down the back and then the bottom piece is then um, sort of knitted in and attached and then this is the weak point here at the crook of the heel uh, and this would have been under a huge amount of stress and strain so what they did is first off it started as a few stitches to secure it and then as with everything necessity becomes more flamboyant uh, so they started to you know develop more more interesting designs and such this is a very simple one but you see ones with crowns and flowers with all sorts of wonderful embroidery now in and also knitted into it you have the person's monogram which is quite exciting and these are also unworn and the reason we know that is because one they're pretty darn flat um as in there's a pretty definite crease in them still but also they they have their sort of makers tags in uh which you know there would have been red threads sort of running between both keeping them together in the same way as when you buy a modern pair of socks you have the tags holding them together now um so that's a wonderful detail uh and another interesting thing is that here we have channels on the inside for a piece uh of either uh wool silk or linen tape in order to tie it round and keep the stockings up. Another way in which stockings like these could be kept up is with garter buckles. Now, garter buckles are, where did I put mine? Oh, here they are. are small decorative buckles. So here you can actually see a floral design which is worn off because it's, um, so this would have attached to the garter at the back, and then you have these little clips that allow it to graduate in size and how sort of tight you want it. So this wouldn't have ever been seen. Um, I mean, unless you sort of hoiked up a lady's dress, uh, or if you, um, uh, or a pair of gentlemen's um, bridges fell down or something like that, which is really, really interesting. Um, so, so these are English silver um, and it's hard to date simply because the, um, the, I don't know if you can see, but the hallmarks are pretty much rubbed off. So these were under a lot of wear and tear, but it's a fascinating thing that these sorts of things existed. And because of these edges to them, you could, sorry, but, because of these edges to them, you could actually insert them directly into the stocking 
wider apart and then it would sort of bunch up the rest of it so there are a few different ways and it was very versatile now men's stockings during the period only really differ um to women's stockings in regards to the fact um of size in terms of color shape and design there really is uh no nowhere you can't go there is a huge array uh, of brightly embroidered colored and knitted uh stockings that belong to men uh it, it's a bit like nowadays sometimes you have gentlemen uh who might um wear a sort of interesting pair of socks with their suit you know it's that extra form of self-expression really uh which which you can't necessarily show off with your normal modern outfit however the readers gentlemen obviously had a lot more scope to show off so we've okay, slow um so we have the stockings and then the other thing that's close to your skin would be your shirt now shirts from you know as with shifts from the medieval period up till you know the middle of the 19th century the construction of shirts doesn't really change they're all cut from squares and triangles and it's all about geometry and saving fabric with the width of the fabric and the only thing that really changes between georgian um, and regency shirts is the things like the height of the collar length of the cuff and the fullness of the sleeves so in the earlier 18th century you see much larger voluminous sleeves um, especially in the um, 1720s and 30s, uh, where you have, you know, so much sleeve showing around the cuff and everything, and it being a show of wealth, because it showed the fineness of the linen. And this doesn't change in the Regency period. So you'd have fine linen on the um, collar and cuffs. Um, and sometimes you have shirts which are made of a medium grade linen, but they have a more expensive linen uh, and a much more finely woven and gossamer type linen on the cuffs and collar and then some decorative lace or frill on the front so it's that whole thing of the rest of the shirt wasn't expensive um but i'm going to imagine uh you know I, i'm going to give you the impression that it was expensive um by the collar and cuffs etc now the the Rootsy shirt you know i'm not going to take it off but generally speaking there's um two or three buttons um here so so i have two buttons here uh in the georgian period with the banded shirts on as you had uh two or three as well to close it across the neck but as you can see the real change here is the fact that it comes up and past and really onto the face um that there is a sort of more period in the 1820s and 1830s where it really comes up you know really close to the face um and these were it it was a way of showing the expense in the fact that linen was very expensive um well good linen was it also showed that you could afford starch um because of course you'd have your collar starched mine isn't because i can't be bothered and so these were all signifiers to someone else of saying this is how wealthy i am or how well put together i am and your shirts generally, uh, if you were a married uh, man or looking to get married, um, your, your shirts would generally sort of be sewn together by the ladies of the household. Now, bachelors, of course, can go out and yeah. buy shirts if they wish, but generally speaking... It's going to be difficult to see what I'm doing on the chain of the rings. Um, they, um, they were very generally... Um, made by the ladies of the house as a way in which obviously the gentleman in the house could then go out and then show off the handiwork of the ladies of the house. So there's all those signifiers in terms of dressing in that regard. Now, when it came to underwear, you've got um, a few different options. The shirts are obviously quite long, going to about sort of um, the mid calf and even the knee and the night shirts right down to the floor almost. Um, and what you do is you would tuck um, the front of the shirt and the back of the shirt together to sort of create, you know, best way to describe it, a sort of nappy, as it were. Um, and you put your britches on and everything's squared away. The other option uh, is for a, uh, for a set of drawers. These could be made um, from linen, um, wool, 
uh, and things like that. Now, when I say wool, I'm actually looking at more of a um, a wool flannel. So it's softer and it's actually quite, you know, thermal. Because of course, if you're wearing, say, silk breeches out and about and you need that extra layer of warmth, then you'll build that warmth into your underwear. You also have un under waistcoats as well, which are um, worn either against the skin um, or just on top of your shirt, but generally speaking, right against the skin. Uh, there is a wonderful one that belonged to um, uh, Lord Nelson at the Maritime Museum, uh, which is fascinating. It's a closely um, woven garment. So it's all about layering to add warmth. We think very much now of always being coats on coats on coats. The layering of clothing really starts much, much closer to the skin, really. Um, and then to sort of finish off those foundation layers, you then have the cravat. Now, the cravat of the period goes from a long strip of um, linen uh, in the 18th century to a massive square. Now, the massive square could be sort of a yard square. I tend to do about sort of 30 inches or so, um, but it does depend on the cravat style you need and want and like, really. Um, I don't have an original cravat or shirt or pair of drawers. They're exceptionally rare. Um, but you would then fold and fold and press and starch. So it's that whole thing of right by your face, you have, um, it's almost like the equivalent of wearing an iPhone or two around your neck in terms of the expense of garments that went into them. Because of course, if you were fashionable at the time, you would have been using rice starch. Um, rice starch being, you know, most highly prized and the whitest starch that there was. Um, and this would then go on to your gossamer linen cravat, which was very expensive in and of itself. So there are those layers of really sort of showing um, what you could do, what you could afford, and how well looked after you were. Um, and I find that fascinating, but because we don't sort of attain those same sort of attributes. And it also links into the fact um, that previously when everyone's wearing wigs, they're putting starch in their hair for the powdering. So this was still a heavily taxed thing. So to be, so to be using the starch then on your shirt and everything was just another way of using it, but it was sort of showing everyone how wealthy you were. Now, with wearing your shirt, um, you, in, in the 18th century uh, and into the 19th, you could have the um, cuffs put together with sleeve buckles. So here are some um, really quite fancy um, Georgian sleeve buckles. Um, and they would link, you know, very much like cufflinks, and they were called shirt links. Um, and then they sort of fall out of favour because of the tightening of the sleeve. Um, it becomes a pain, so they just end up buttoning it to a single lap. And then for putting the, the front of the shirt together, in the 18th and into the 19th century, you have the sort of lover's brooch, um, or, or referred to as a lock and booth brooch. Um, and this would, so on mine I have buttons here, but no buttons down, down the rest of my shirt. Um, it's all sort of frills, so it doesn't matter. But to sort of keep those layers together if you're wearing a more open waistcoat or something, um, you would use one of these and pin it in place um, to, to sort of keep things together. Generally they're heart shaped, um, but you do find ones that are squares, triangles and circles. But these were the sort of preferred, preferred to ones uh, from the period, which are just, I think quite delightful. And it's a very simple, close to the, close to the body garment. Um, and they could be made from precious metals um, with diamonds in, um, if you're really fancy, um, or right the way down to plain old iron and tin. Um, and along with your cravat, you could also wear a stock. Now a stock is a strip of gathered linen, so it creates sort of this gathered effect, then tabs on the end, and then, then it would fit together using one of these. This is a stock buckle. 
So the cravat would, uh, the stock would have uh, but eyelets or small buttonholes here, and then you'd lap the rest in there, and this would sit comfortably at the back of your neck, at the back of the cravat, and this wouldn't really be seen by anyone. So this is another example of sort of the, um, almost like the fascination of underwear, you know, you knowing that you're wearing it, but no one else. Um, but, but with this being much more popular in the earlier Georgian period, where the collars are much lower, um, you, you'd probably get a sight of it um, with the movement of the wig bag and the wig, you'd get the occasional glint of this um, in a ballroom or out in the sunshine. Um, so, so this is made of silver and paste. Paste, um, black dot paste, is um, faceted glass and became all the rage and actually for a while outstripped diamonds in terms of popularity. Um, and to give it that sort of reflection, they would back the insets with um, a tin, quite literally a tin foil, or sometimes a silver foil, um, and then put a little black dot, um, and that sort of helps give it depth. It's very interesting, um, I mean, I think. And these were, you know, use, used by everyone. So it's one of those things that you can bling it up if you like, or it can be as simple as possible. Of course, soldiers wore these, um, but they wore much more plain brass ones, um, or sometimes people just use ties at the back instead. Uh, there's a pair in a German museum, which uh, which is solid gold with sapphires and rubies, and it's like, why? <laughs> but after all, it's that thing of um, just shoving as much money into an object as you possibly can. Now we move on to the next layer, which would be the waistcoat. So I'm here wearing um, a double-breasted, uh, shawl-collared um, waistcoat. But here we have an original waistcoat from the um, late 18th century, sort of 1790s, and this is embroidered, and it's in beautiful condition. It's as if it was um, made and then never worn. Uh, so it has functional pockets. So, so this would have been um, a style probably for more of a day-to-day -day, um, garment, but also maybe for formal evening wear, but it's not quite at court level. Court tends to get a bit more exciting, um, but this is a wonderful, wonderful garment um, with a lovely sort of collar. And the type of stitching used is actually, um, you know, tambour or what we sometimes use, you know, um, cruel stitch. But, but this is um, done on a much, much smaller scale. And then it has the embroidered buttons as well. It is tiny. Um, it doesn't actually fit me. Um, I've tried, but I will definitely be taking a pattern from it. Um, I've been meaning to for ages. But what's interesting is that the front is the most sumptuous, expensive silks, um, which is then embroidered and put together. And then on the reverse, we have it just lined in plain, run-of-the-mill, not even fine, fancy linen. It, it's just all show, it's all facade, and this is very much what um, pieces throughout history are about. Um, well, not are about, but they had very different priorities. So, and then there's a nice thicker linen for the back. And I'm thinking, you know, this linen is not super thick, but it's, it's gonna have some sort of heft and warmth to it. You know, so so in here, you can you can sort of kind of see the the layers of interfacing. Um, no, it's quite tricky in the light, but but there's interfacing and a button stand here, and the whole thing is obviously hand sewn, uh, and it's truly truly beautiful um, with with period techniques sewn together with linen and silk threads, with then um, linen. Um, uh, button stands and interfacings. It's really a beautiful piece and is very reminiscent of pieces of the period, including the piecing. Now, nowadays, if you're using fabric, you'll cut out the piece you need, and that's that. Now, for the period, it was a case of saving every little scrap of fabric, and that can be seen throughout the um, throughout a lot of history, really. Um, it's quite a modern um, idea to just waste fabric, it seems. And of course, right at the back, 
there's no point for embroidery. No one's going to see it. So it's a practical, fancy garment, uh, which which I think is quite lovely. And it creates a lovely um, shape. And it has, of course, the more conservative small C um, uh, styling at the back. So just giving you a nice look at the embroidery itself, which is just lovely. Uh, I'm going to do an um, examination of this waistcoat on YouTube, so it will be much higher quality, and so you can see more of the detail, um, as well as inside the pockets. It's wonderful, and the sheen and texture of the fabric is just delightful. Now, now we, in fact, um, sorry to sort of change things around slightly, but I think it might be useful that whilst I have this in my hands, if anyone has any sort of uh, burning questions uh, or something, it, because to me, I've looked over this a lot and I sort of forget that there's interesting stuff about it sometimes. So if someone wants to, you know, if people feel like they want to answer questions, um, it, it, is that something that um, you're up for doing or shall we just leave it to the end? Sorry. There were a few questions on chat. Um... Zach, so oh, um, yeah. they could speak up. Uh, Chantelle has a question about colours and decorative patterns. Some questions about paste. I don't know if you can see the chat and uh, oh, yeah, get yeah. in there. No, I've just brought it up. Fantastic, thank you. I, I don't think I've ever used the chat before. Okie dokie, right. Um, did colours and certain decorative patterns play a part with cravats and signifying wealth? Yes, they did, thank you. Um, so in cravats, you have very different styles um, in terms of length of cravat, style of knot, um, as well as you can have coloured cravats. So um, there, of course, is the French Revolutionary one, which is red, white, blue. Um, and then, of course, there, there are even ones um, in green silk, which were called the Irish cravat and things like that. So it was very much a case also what you're wearing your cravat for. They can also be finely embroidered. Um, there really isn't anything out of the realms when it comes to something as versatile as the cravat. Um, so there, there is evidence that, um, uh, that certain cravats and certain colours, um, if you bought from one particular shop, it, it then became a sort of code for the underground um, LGBT community at the time. So basically gay men in terms of wearing, oh, you're wearing that sort of, that that cravat from that particular place means X Y Z, so it's a signifier, uh, which which I think is really fascinating. Okay, so so those are the so that's the only real question I can see at the moment without going too far up, and um, which I'm not going to do. So, um, so yes, and and another fun thing about the piecing is that this piece is completely blank but then on this piece there's a little spring so um that's another detail as well as in terms of saving fabric they're thinking well this bit's going to have wear and tear against the coat and everything as well as no one's ever going to see this piece so they cut it economically um so so there's a lot we can learn from the economics of cutting um unlike um things we cut out today so that's an embroidered waistcoat and then i have a um, a later waistcoat from, from sort of 18, uh, 15, 18, 20 in black wool. Now, still with that, um, that sort of more conservative point at the bottom, but not quite the kick at the back. So this one no longer has its buttons, um, which I presume were probably silk covered or possibly um, passementary, something like that. It's hard to know without really looking. And this is a nice collar to it, but the whole thing is lined in silk. But you can see where at one point there was a facing to it, probably in the same wool. So it had a longer life um, than just sort of, you know, one use. So it was constantly sort of reimagined. So it's silk. And then we, we have a twill woven fabric here, which I, I can't work out whether it's a twill woven silk or it could possibly be a twill, um, a twill woven um, uh, wool, 
so sort of like a worsted, which was quite commonly used um, because it gave structure um, as well as, I mean, there are wools out there which you could wear which don't really give you any warmth. Um, you know, wool isn't always a thermal, thermal thing. It's a very versatile material. And the great thing is with this being in such a state of disrepair, you can actually see how it's constructed. And that's fun. And it, and it gives a complete polar opposite to the other ways that which is pristine and should not be altered. Um, that this one, you know, has moth holes and rips and things like that. And, and I think it's wonderful. Uh, so for example, you know, but the moths have really been at it. Um, and as you can see with the more conservative sort of style of pocket with the pointed style, which means that this could be, um, you know, a later design uh, for someone belonging to the clergy or the law um, because their clothes um, would lend themselves to the more traditional cut and style. So here on, yeah, there's actually a rip in the facing so you can see how it's constructed with the wool being, um, being turned and then you're having the button stand and the glazed linen um, giving support and structure to the garment. You can actually see where there's two, two layers um, in terms of there's no point doing one great big strip or the tailor didn't have one great big strip so he just shoved another strip in there. And this is to give body uh, to this area. See so here is glazed linen and then here, it, well a dark glazed linen and here is a lighter glazed linen. Um, so a sort of semi-starched garment and um, sort of give it body and strength for here where the buttons would have gone. And it has the same dark glazed linen on the inside interfacing the collar. Um, so yes, that's, and, and this one is also completely hand sewn. Um, I'm trying to get a good point where you can see, yeah, here, here's a good, one where you can sort of really see the stitches, which is quite nice. And the difference between the more showy fabric, um, which would have gone against uh, the other garments, and then the more utilitarian internal fabrics. And here you can see the glazed linen, but also the pocket bag. Now, the pockets, are, it's quite tricky to see it's black on black, but they are sewn around by hand uh, with linen thread. Um, and the way you can tell it's um, linen thread is because it's lightened in color slightly, that the, the, the dyes sort of come out of it a bit. And then there's the pocket bag in there. It's a wonderful um, piece to really uh, see how certain wools were treated. So this is a particularly fine wool. This would have been a sort of super fine, um, and because of that, uh, you have the, the edges are turned. So on a lot of period garments, um, if it's a good wool, um, the edges are cut raw. Um, however, on the front edges, they are often turned because that would have the most wear. And no matter how well fooled a wool, um, you could still um, have issues with that. Now, what's also interesting is that the lining that you see here goes all the way so that the silk um, is more of a on top type thing as opposed to taking the strain of the wear and tear of the garment. Not that it's done so well because it has you know come apart over time, which, which I find interesting because it shows that this piece was loved and used. Now the back is also in a dark glazed linen uh, which is called glazed Holland uh, because one of the best places that made it was Holland. So to make this sort of glazed linen, this glazed Holland, uh, you would have um, impregnated, so you would have had the linen and then you would have impregnated with beeswax and then the and then the whole thing would have been put under eight tonne weighted um, heated rollers. So they had sort of coal um, or, or um, hot iron rods shoved in these turning things that weighed eight tonnes in order to press the fabric and pregnant fabric and create this shiny effect, um, which is truly fascinating. And it is a twill weave, which is just interesting to me. Um, and of course it has lacing at the back with what's quite exciting, 
here, so these are um, sewn in metal eyelets, so to give it strength. Um, but here, this this sort of bendy strip of thing here at the end, which is stopping, if it's done tightly, stopping it just ripping out the fabric, is a piece of whalebone. Uh, so a piece of baleen, and there you are. You can see just how bendy it is, which is just exciting. So whalebone, of course, isn't actually the bones of a whale. Uh, it's the um, sort of front mouthpiece of the sperm whale. Um, and it's used to sort of filter fish. And these are used in corsets and stays um, and things like that. And yeah, so this is, so I'm just checking on time. Okay, yeah. So this is then, you know, a waistcoat and then lined in silk. And then the same sort of twill woven um, wool, uh, more a shalloon than anything else on the inside of both. Now, with waistcoats, there really is no, um, uh, there really is no sort of finite thing of they have to be made from this or have to be made from that. You find them made of all sorts of fabrics. So now we've done the waistcoat, the next layer uh, of course would have been the leg wear. And this can be, um, in the form of breeches, pantaloons, um, trousers, things like that. And here I have a pair of breeches, um, probably from about 1780. Um, I bought these on eBay um, very recently because someone listed them as Victorian riding trousers and that was not accurate. Um, so these were amazing. And, and these were in pristine condition. Um, as in they were made, you know, it, they're in such good condition, it's as if they were made yesterday. They weren't because of, you know, you can, you can tell this is an original. And it's lined rather interestingly in leather, chamois leather, so lovely and soft. And this um, means that the leather is taking the strain of the garment and not the beautiful um, silk. So, I mean, I, I will also be doing a YouTube video specifically on these breeches and how they're constructed and the fact that they have so many pockets. So they have a fob pocket up here. Now the fob pocket is called such because you would place your fob watch into the fob pocket then it would dangle out and this is where you would also show off fun sort of seals and fobs and things like that. Now the buttons are actually um, original and they are pressed horn. Um, it's, it's hard to turn the light, but, but if you get a, um, a light behind it, you can shine through and you can see the serrations of the horn itself. So the waistband is lined in linen um, and then the rest of it's lined in leather. Um, and it's just fascinating. Like, I can't tell you how fascinating this is, but I'm going to try at least. And then the, um, this part is a washed wool. And then on bits that are going to get lots of wear, there is actually a super fine, similar to the waistcoat you just saw um, here. So because of course, if you're hand brushing it out, taking things in and out of the pockets, you know, the pockets are huge. Nice, nice, big, 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 big pockets. Um, these are called frog pockets because the front flap is called, you know, the frog mouth. Um, and it's all hand sewn, and it's beautiful, just just, just stunning. Um, and then interesting on this side, we have another little side pocket with a covered little button here, which is a nice long pocket, which goes along next to this one. Now the pockets are also um, leather, not the other side of the lining, but their own entity. So around the pockets, it's um, it's sort of like an extra layer of um, leather. And that's not uncommon for the period uh, to have breeches pockets, especially um, made of leather. Um, who knew? So, and then on this side, you have a double pocket. So pocket here and pocket there. And I mean, these are big pockets. I mean, you, you know, big pockets, you could fit a lot in them. Um, 
and then you have the tabs and the most beautiful buttonholes, beautiful buttonholes. Um, and then down the bottom, you have um, the buttons with the knee band. Now to wear and secure your britches, you are going to be using buckles like these. These are breeches buckles. These are um, in sort of, you know, they are um, a black glass, sort of like a jet, jet being slightly different, but it's often called vox, the would have been called voxel glass. Um, and these actually do perfectly fit the britches, but I keep them apart because of course, um, you don't want to add anything to the britches themselves. Um, by the Regency period, britches, well, buckles on britches are falling sort of out of favour as seen as a bit conservative, a bit old hat. Um, and instead, um, people are then using ties with buckles used for more formal events and court wear. And they can be, you know, incredibly bright and brilliant buckles. So that's britches. And in those big pockets, you could keep things like your massive snuff box. And this is another pressed horn. Um, this is from um, the uh, French Revolution. Uh, and someone told me uh, what the things mean, but I can't remember. But it's, um, it's just fascinating and interesting. So this is a man's snuff box and it's quite large. And this could actually go in breeches pocket, coat pocket, um, or waistcoat pocket, because of course, if you have, if you have your pocket watch in your breeches, what are the waistcoat pockets used for? Well, for such things like, you know, you can have a nice agate snuff box, which is cool. And what I quite like is that you can actually see through this bit. And it's, I mean, that's just exciting for me. Um, but, but it's wonderful that, that they're using um, agate. So it's a Scottish. Magnified, but... back. Hmm? Sorry? Just about to see your pictures frozen bits back again. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, co connections all over the place, I suppose. So this is a pocket telescope, um, which isn't quite as exciting. So after you've done the waistcoats, you then have coats. Um, and the style of coat um, is, of course, the tail coat. Now the tail coat, um, you're generally looking at dark blues, but it is also described as olive green um, and snuff colours being incredibly popular as well. Um, and then of course for the evening you can even have embroidered court suits, uh, which get progressively more extreme. Now I thought this is possibly um, a good point to stop and take questions, um, because I realise, you know, time is closing in. So if there's any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. If people want to unmute and ask up, we've had questions from Kate Meakin, um, Chantel about the underground code cravats, uh, Magpie about pockets, Nelson about legwear. So if you want to unmute and ask up, please go ahead. Or I'll just ask your questions. Hello. I love the idea of the pocket telescope as well. Um, I'm just kind of sitting there going, in what occasion would you need a pocket telescope as a Regency gentleman? <laughs> well, um, it, it, it pops up. Um, so it's a fun sort of spy device in a way. So, so you can be at Vauxhall Gardens or something like that and, you know, spy a pretty woman across the, across the walkway and go, oh, check her out type thing. But it's also... Um, looking at the um, advent of science and you know knickknacks and basically a gentleman wanting to be seen as worldly and everything like that now this one's from the period and quite old and actually quite stiff to open and has a habit of just unscrewing <laughs> which is annoying but uh, yes oh, uh, lots of lots of opportunities um, to use them, you could use them at the theatre, but there are a few fashion plates uh, from the 1790s of men using them to look 
at ladies. Um, so, you know, some things never change. Hello there. Oh, sorry. Hello, I hear a voice. Uh -huh. I, I've got a, a question about leg wear, uh, although oh. it, it kind of applies more generally to fashions, I guess. Uh, specifically thinking about the 1790s when you sort of get the the pantaloons and the trousers sort of starting to become socially okay-ish. Yeah. Uh, and obviously you get other fashions at the same time, like the, the new cuts in tailcoat, the, the sort of advent of the conical top hat for a while. And I was just kind of wondering how they're styled when they first come in. Like, because I, I can't conceive of, say of trousers being worn with a cox hat or with certain cuts of tailcoat. Mm -hmm. How did they navigate that when they first came in? Mm. So, um, interestingly, what um, trousers have been around for a while. Um, they're worn in the French Revolution, and it was that whole thing of, oh, this practical garment, which a country gentleman could even wear sort of walking about his estate, suddenly became a thing of, oh, but the revolutionaries are <laughs> like wearing them and making it a thing. Let's not promote that too much. Um, so, so things have to cool off. France has to get some stuff sorted before the rest of the world is like, okay, maybe we can try trousers. Um, so you have sailor slops, uh, which are used, but um, I, I believe it's in 1802 when the young Prince of Wales is walking in Brighton um, as a younger man uh, wearing, um, wearing uh, wearing trousers and then it became a thing of okay he's wearing them it's fine and there are fashion plates uh, out there of men wearing them more so in the east uh, wearing them with cocked hats and, and tailcoats so so they are actually quite versatile and they simply just become a looser easier to wear garment and they come at various lengths so there are some that sort of end sort of as a three-quarter length almost like a pantaloon but it's the looser style that people are particularly fond of with them um, and then when they become more of a mainstay and completely replace um, bridges and pantaloons sort of in the 1820s, 1830s, they become more tailored. They start off as much more flowy garments and then become more tailored from about 1815 onwards uh, to the point where they become very drain pipey and tied under the um, boot um, in the 1820s and 1830s. So does that sort of help um, yeah. answer your question? Yes. Uh, thank you. No, 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 not at all. Pleasure. So can I ask, the mm. waistcoats had really narrow pockets at the bottom. You call them functional pockets. Mm. What would the function have been? They, they didn't look big enough to put anything in. <laughs> no, I don't. So, so, um, uh, so on another original I have, which is boxed away, um, there, there are pockets in them which are huge, huge. Um, but, but there is some sort of decent pocket size. So, so you can sort of, you know, with a snuff box like this, it's, it's hard doing it this way around, you know, comfortably, comfortably fits in there. Um, you know, coinage, you could, you could fit in there. Um, and in the embroidered one, you know, if, if you're wearing stuff like this, you've got gums with other pockets on. But also, you know, the, the pockets do go right down to the bottom of the outfit. So comfortably, you can put a few little doodads in there. Um, you know, a pencil, a traveling inkwell, um, all those sorts of things. And you, you see it with the age of manufacturing becoming much more slimline uh, with things that would have been larger getting small. And then you have men's a tweeze and things like that with with them. Um, pens butter knives in and things like that they get smaller and smaller and smaller and more condensed so they can fit in smaller pockets um and that's something fascinating as well that the the fact that the stuff you put in your pockets gets smaller as pockets get smaller whereas now we have sort of fairly universally sized pockets as men um and the things we put in our pockets are somehow getting larger um, so things like phones and everything are getting much, much larger when originally it was the whole thing of making it smaller. Um, so, you know, there, there are some parallels to be, to be brought. Um, but generally speaking, yes, those are particularly small pockets, but you do have, um, as, with, as with this waistcoat here, uh, which is modelled after an original with big pockets, you know, I can fit my whole hand comfortably in there. Uh, so it's very much 
very um it, it varies from garment to garment really thank you I, no, not ask, i'm desperately trying not to ask anything about bridgerton so i'll try something else um so in in comparison with the pockets that the men seem to have a lot of pockets what about the women the are the equivalent do they have it's, yes it's like a, the whole po political aspect actually of women and pockets mm. is quite interesting about how po not having pockets limits what you can do and what you can carry exactly so so it's a little bit of a historical myth that women didn't have pockets and didn't have places to put things um pockets were in so many guards um so in the 18th century uh, you of course have pannier um, and pocket hoops and things like that. And there are accounts of, uh, there's a German account of a woman keeping chicks in, in one of her pockets. You know, these are huge pockets, like the size of a bucket. They can be huge. Um, and then um, the sort of tie-on pockets around the waist, um, which get a bit old hat by the Regency period, but are still worn because I've seen a few gowns with slits just on one side for a pocket. But because of the changing waistline, it's not very practical. So women then start using reticules. Um, but also women women wear things like aprons, which could have pockets in, um, as well as cloaks. You can have insert, insert pockets in there and with pelises and things. So wherever you can think of putting a pocket, everyone always has. Um, so in, and, and it's also a thing of who makes the garments. So in women's wear in the 19th century, things that are made by tailors, such as riding habits and pelisses and such, tend to have pockets in, as opposed to dresses, which don't. So tailors are obviously used to putting pockets in things, so we'll automatically put pockets in things, rather than with women's wear, it becomes a whole thing of, oh, suddenly, because the waistline is changing, we need to um, adapt the way uh, that women carry things and push handbags on everyone, really, which start off as reticules. So yes, there are pockets, and women could store lots in them, um, and it's almost a bit bizarre that nowadays women don't really have pockets um, because the handbag industry has sort of overtaken the practical side of things. But yes, there was a um, there was a period um, during the suffragette movement where women's clothes didn't sort of naturally have pockets in, um, or not to the same extent as men's pockets. Um, but they did; they they still have pockets in. Um, you see Victorian gowns with hip pockets, watch pockets pockets stuffed in the side of skirts, because there's all that volume to take up. Um, so there are po pockets in garments, um, more so than people are necessarily led to believe. Thank you, Zach. That has been, that's been fabulous. I've learned some stuff today. That's absolutely amazing. Not really, talk, but... really serious tailoring the, the, the close of the day, weren't it? Very much so. And, and, and it really is the advent of mathematics in tailoring as well. So it's that whole period of the the enlightenment in the 18th century the use of maths in everyday life which then lead people to these tailored garments um, and things like the scientific curiosities of a pocket telescope yeah well thank you for doing that for us i really appreciate it because you've done 45 minutes for us on a saturday night when i'm sure you had better things to do oh yeah of course there's so much to do uh, oh yeah theater yeah. holidays you know let's go out and do stuff no. <laughs> Thank you very much, Zach. I do appreciate it. We've got one.